Our God is an awesome God. God creates the beauty that we see. These images remind us of God's power and of God's love for God's people. Inspire us to be creators of beauty as well. In your name, we express our thankfulness and joy. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar Christ, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God, we take this opportunity to breathe deeply. 
We take a moment to admire your handiwork. All that you have created is good. Remind us of who you have created us to be. Remind us of the creativity you have woven into our minds and spirits. It is our desire to express our love for you and for this world that you have made. May the work of our hands, the very work of our lives, be a reflection of that love. We come on this day to worship. We come for inspiration and encouragement, even as you send us out to encourage and inspire others. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. And as we come together, we pray the prayer that we have been taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, Mark at Hope. Is there an art form or craft that you enjoy doing? If you'd like to share some examples of your work, please send images and explanations to Pastor Christopher and we'll feature them this summer. Share your art, your sculpture, your prints, whatever art or craft you do, we'd love to share it with everyone else. Please send things and we'll look forward to sharing them. A report from this year's annual conference from one of our lay members. Two years ago, I attended annual conference in Traverse City, a wonderful gathering of nearly 2,000 people, worshiping, eating, listening to reports, eating, legislating, eating, complaining together. The connection that is Methodism obvious. We ended that conference knowing that the next conference together, 2020, would be very different. We thought because general conference was going to occur before our conference, and with it, the certain division of the church we call United. Little did we know how truly different things would be. Our world shut down, no general conference was held, and our annual conference of last year was bare bones. Just those things that had to be dealt with within the legal framework of the church were discussed and decided. Conference 2021 was a very different event. We have lived with the pandemic a year longer and can now see the light at the end of our long, dark tunnel. Our capabilities and ease with using Zoom have been nearly perfected, although a few mics refused to be unmuted and once I heard dogs bark in the background. And so we conferenced together, but separate, each of us in our own homes. Not the same, but then nothing this year has been. Conference this year called Singing the Lord's Song was themed around Psalm 137, probably my favorite psalm, with the well-known phrase, but how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We have indeed lived in a foreign land this year. For a time, the Lord's song <coughs> indeed seemed silenced. But our wonderful, grace-filled bishop noted that we have found ways to sing the Lord's song, to be in ministry for Jesus Christ in this strange time, in this foreign land. And we, in fact, sang the Lord's song as we worshiped with the bishop, with the native community of Green Sky Hill United, Indian United Methodist Church of Lower Michigan, with the Korean United Methodist Church, with Dr. Cynthia Wilson, an uncommonly gifted worship leader from the Great Plains Annual Conference, and finally with Paul Perez, Director of Connectional Ministry of the Michigan Conference. Psalm 137 rang true and through in all of these worship experiences. 
annual conference, however, is also about the business of the church, separate from or maybe alongside the worship of the church. We heard reports from various boards and agencies. Awards were given. We virtually, virtually met those pastors at the beginnings of their careers as well as those at the end. We remembered those who had died since the last conference. And of course, we had legislation. Legislation to be voted on this year included the usual resolutions on housing and rental allowances, health insurance, parsonage guidelines, equitable compensation for our pastors, our covenant partnership with Liberia, and so on. But after the events of this year, there were also resolutions having to do with education and training regarding racism, cross-racial appointments, and affirming the bishop's anti-racism working group. There was much discussion, agreement, and disagreement on the resolution having to do with Christian nationalism and its part in the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. The specter of the certain untying of the United Methodist Church was present throughout, as questions were so often asked that began, what happens if, or what happens when? Our resolu one resolution, a vote on which post-separation church the Michigan Conference would join, was disallowed by the bishop as it did not accurately reflect the protocol which will be presented at the general conference for the proposed split. It was a good conference, impressive in worship, in the amazing use of technology, and in the caring and thoughtfulness of the participants. I love annual conference. My mother thought I was crazy because she hated meetings. And as much, as good as this was, I did so miss being truly together. My respect and admiration for our bishop continues to grow. We are in good hands at this difficult time as we learn to sing the Lord's song in this strange land. Bishop Bard ended his introductory remarks on Friday with, you think that an institution that is on the decline, that cannot keep itself together, that seems terribly outdated and irrelevant to some, cannot be a purveyor of grace, a beacon of hope, hands for healing, and an instrument of love? Stay tuned, he said, stay tuned. And then he continued, we live in strange times, and yet we are people of strangely warm hearts, strangely hopeful spirits, who know that with God, strange things are happening every day. Peaceful things, justice things, creative things, healing things, hopeful things, love things. In the words of John Wesley, the best of all is God is with us. So stay tuned, Marquette Hope, while we learn once again how to sing the Lord's song. Stay tuned. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, let there be light. And so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit, and also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the same way that this potter works his clay, I work on you, people of Israel.
Our worship series for this part of the summer is all about art. Since Art on the Rocks isn't happening again this year, sadly, although local artists are planning to go ahead with the Outback Art Fair at Picnic Rocks, Mark at Hope brings you art, summer 2021. Over the next several weeks, we'll look at faith and art together. And since it's summer, let's take a deep breath, enjoy the beauty around us, and spend some weeks exploring art and our faith. I always liked studying art in school because it was the subject that had pictures. Unlike math, where you write stuff down, numbers and symbols, and maybe if you're lucky, there's a diagram because it's geometry, and reading, which is, well, just reading, Art is always interesting because it's something to look at while you learn. Studying art and history together is kind of the best combination, I think. And when you study the history of art, you end up studying the history of the church along the way. Every time you look at a piece of art in a museum, you say, what Bible story is this a picture of? What does it look like that for? Why is this the way the artist pictured it? When and where is it from? All these questions and more are the things we ask when we look at the art of the last 2,000 years. So much of the art in the great museums of the world is an illustration of some biblical story or character. The history of art and the church are really inseparable. And that intersection, you could also call it a collision course of history, art, and faith, is what brought me into ministry. So that's the in a nutshell version of how I got here. And our scripture today is the in a nutshell version of how all of us got here. It's just the very beginning of the story. It's creation in every sense. And it's where we start as we look at how art illustrates our faith, and what rich meanings and inspiration we can receive by spending a little time reflecting on both. God creates. That's the story. And so how does art illustrate that cosmic moment of the creation of everything? Well, it's hard to know exactly what it would have looked like, so artists have to interpret it and attempt to put into a picture the thoughts, feelings, and ideas they have, which is really the same thing we all do, no matter how much artistic talent we think we have. We all have to take a story like creation and imagine it and come up with what we think it look like. We hear it, we interpret it, and we imagine it. Faith and art are pretty much the same process and involve the same parts of us, even if the end result isn't a picture you would hang on the wall. So what does creation look like to you? Do you think of something like outer space? Some sort of billion-year time-lapse where lightning strikes and planets grow and mountains rise and seas form. Maybe your imagination is something totally different. It seems like a lot of contemporary artists sort of go with a, a swirly, colorful, divine, creative soup idea. Interesting interpretations. It does kind of evoke the idea that out of nothing, God made everything. Perhaps, though, the most famous interpretation is Michelangelo's painting from the Sistine Chapel of God creating Adam. The divine spark jump-starting the human being, certainly one of the most celebrated and remembered scenes in the world. And it almost didn't happen. Not the creation of Adam and all humanity. That was maybe the creation, uh, the pinnacle of creation, some would say, and very much God's plan. But the Sistine Chapel, at least the paintings in it, almost didn't happen. The building was built about 30 years before Michelangelo painted it by Pope Sixtus IV, which is where the name comes from, the Sistine Chapel. And by the early 1500s, not too long later, the then Pope, Julius II, wanted it to be covered in paintings. 
And Julius II was one of those popes who was more of a king, a warrior, a general, and he spent a lot of his time and wealth planning for things that would commemorate his many victories. He had already commissioned the gifted sculptor Michelangelo to make a gigantic elaborate tomb for him for when he needed it in the future, and he asked him to repaint the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which was already painted. It was covered in stars on a deep blue field so that when you looked up into it, it was like you were looking up into the sky. But the Pope wanted it covered with scenes from the book of Genesis and prophets and biblical characters all over. Michelangelo didn't want the job, some scholars say, because he wasn't a painter. He was a sculptor. And he didn't have any experience with the fresco painting technique where an artist paints into wet plaster, which actually makes a really durable picture. It becomes the wall surface, not just a picture on the wall. But it, the Pope was the Pope. And so Michelangelo spent the next four years working on the paintings on the ceiling of the chapel. See, this is such an interesting history with pictures. And yet, we're in a worship service, not an art history lecture, so let's consider this from a faith with pictures perspective. What's happening here? What exactly do we learn about this scene, not just from a historic and artistic perspective, but for our faith? We see that a touch, even the smallest touch from God, is enough to bring life. And when you look at the picture, it's a little bit not clear about what is happening. Is God about to share that divine spark? Or is it that God just did and it's showing that moment right after they have made contact and Adam has come to life? Either way, Adam is receiving life directly from the source, and he will in turn give life to all of humanity. And that's a pretty dramatic way to interpret all of those ideas right in that picture on the ceiling. And the way the human form is rendered, and the way the scene suggests Adam's future offspring all there um, with God. Perhaps that's even Eve there, tucked under God's arm, some scholars say. And the whole part around God kind of looks like it's a brain. It's a truly breathtaking, epic illustration. But why? Why illustrate it so? If God could create a universe out of nothing making light itself, which is really the most basic building block of life, perhaps. All the chemicals that have to be present for life to happen still need to be present, but they need light waves for their reactions to happen. So it sounds like God could have just whipped up all the basic ingredients, UV light, carbon, hydrogen, etc., and let them do their things all across space. And voila, life in some form would grow to make a world for us, to make a world. Well, that's entirely above and beyond and entirely on purpose. Again, why? Sometimes people say, God made creation and especially people because God was lonely. And as romantic and sweet as that sounds, it's terrible theology because it suggests that God is incomplete and imperfect, dependent on us other than the way around. I'm pretty sure by definition, God exists completely independently of anything and anyone else. But we can get some good out of this idea. No, God didn't need to create us, but God wanted to for the sheer joy of it and to show that relationship with God and by extension with others, with other living things and creation itself is vitally, deeply important. God wants people. God is not some divine clockmaker who wound up the universe and then went off to do other things. God is intensely interested in us as a people. And as people, our lives are not meaningless. 
God is connected to us and loves us in more ways than we can ever fathom. Not because God has to, but because God wants to. How can we look at an image like Michelangelo's creation of Adam and not be moved? How can we ponder it and not be in awe that the same God who made the world would want to know each of us? That's the plan that God made us on purpose. The plan is that we are the plan. God created the world for us, and so that means we're a part of God's plan. Wow! But then, still, why? Or maybe we should shift the big question, not why, what? What is the plan? How am I a part of it? Is someone going to make it clear sometime what exactly the plan is? Yes. Yes is the big answer to the big question. However, before we think that we know all the answers to all the big questions, ask yourself if you know what your part of God's plan is. If you can answer that right in way right now, that's awesome. If you're thinking, I'll need some time to think about that and get back to you, that's also awesome. In fact, that's more likely in my experience because the very essence of being a follower of Jesus, the very core of being a person of faith is to always be working on or thinking about that very question. Whether you actually, consciously, on purpose think that thought, or whether you are sort of always on that path, moving in that direction. What is my part in God's plan? That's the question. We answer that question all the time when we ask ourselves, what's the right thing to do in this situation? What should I do? What should I say? What would Jesus do? And as much as that may sound like a constantly evolving, shifting, turning, changing path and maybe a lot of work, relax, take a deep breath, like I said at the beginning, because this is a joyful, creative invitation to see our place in God's creation and see the beauty around us and let it fill us and color in our faith so that we show the world that we, we are God's artwork, alive and beautiful. Amen. Anytime a heart turns from darkness to light Anytime temptation comes and someone stands to fight Anytime somebody lives to serve and not to serve I know, I know Anytime in weakness someone falls upon their knees Or dares to seek the truth that sets men free Anytime the choice is made to stand upon the word I know, I know, I know, I know God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah God is on the move in many mighty Anytime the gospel stirs a searching soul And someone says, send me, here I go I know, I know
some announcements and messages for this week. We hope you're enjoying Pod Church. Please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and be notified each time there's a new video. It's back! The Ministry Summit. What is it? A Ministry Summit is a big picture program outreach workshopping session. When is it? Saturday, June 26th. Mark your calendars at the Connection Center from 10 a.m. to noon. Pre-COVID, these brainstorming gatherings were quarterly at Marquette Hope. This summit will be the first one held since October 19th, 2019. You're not going to want to miss it. Who is it? Everyone. Many programs and projects have had their roots in past ministry summits, which are designed to nurture creativity, build consensus, and encourage awesome ideas. The more, the merrier. Join us as we dare to dream and make some plans. Let's explore the directions God is calling us into next as a foresight United Methodist faith community. All are welcome. See you there. To learn more about everything that's happening in and around Marquette Hope, check out our Facebook page. You can also get our newsletter on the Facebook as well. God sends us out on a path and with a purpose. Go out into God's beautiful world. Find ways to nurture the gifts you have been given. Find ways to offer the gifts you have been given. Amen. Church is the weekly online worship of Marquette Hope, a United Methodist faith community located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Find us at facebook.com slash mqthope, mqthope.com, and on YouTube.